Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe on the show that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who actually live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest on the show today. Please help me welcome to the show Mayor Spencer Coyne of the town of Princeton in the province of British Columbia. Spencer, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. So, Spencer, you've listened to the show before, hence why I reached out. Uh, where did your sense of duty come from? That's a really good question, and I've been thinking about this one. Um, I think it comes from my family, to be honest. Uh, I've always been involved in in the community. Um, my great grandfather, my dad, my grandfather, all involved in the community. Um, we've got a long, I guess, long history of service to the community. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, and it was never a, a, something you thought about, you just something you did, because that's what you do, right? Community helps raise you, you, you give back to the community, as you, uh, you become of age to do so. So you could have given back in many different ways, whether it be through volunteerism, whether it through nonprofits, but you chose in 2018, if if my research is correct, which sometimes it's not, uh, to give back municipally. What was the draw to municipal politics? Oh, that's that's even a better question. <laughs> um, so 2018 <laughs> is when I when I ran for mayor. I actually ran for council in 2000 and was it two? Uh, I was elected for a term. I was 24 when I got elected. Um, I had been away to university over in Kelowna and uh, there I was active in the student movement there. And uh, I came home and I was doing st uh, courses by correspondence. And my family's been here like from ever. Um, I'm, I'm a member of the Upper Smokey and Indian Band. And this is home. Uh, we've we've always been here. And uh, I come home and all my cousins had moved away. My brother had moved away. My younger sister was still here. She was still in school. But um, the idea that my family and other families that were from here were having to move away to go to work and find a future really scared me. And I ran for council back then because I wanted to make a difference. And one thing I've always been taught my whole life is if you're going to make a complaint or you've got something to complain about, you better be willing to step up and, and try to be part of the solution. So um, I ran for council and to my surprise, was it, I, was it an easy choice to make it municipally because you could have chosen provincial, you could have chosen school board, you could have chosen federal, but you chose municipally. Was that an easy choice? Um, yeah, this is by far the most, um, influential level of government i mean this is grassroots uh every decision we make and i think this is something if anybody's out there listening um that isn't part of the municipal government world every decision we make directly impacts the the world we live in um you know we make a decision that's going to impact your neighbors and you want to make if you want to make a positive change i think this is the best place to do it uh provincial government is a great place to try to make you know, big policy changes, um, but it takes a long time. Whereas here, you you know, back then it was three years, now it's four years. Um, you can do a lot in, in the amount of time that you're sitting as an elected representative of municipal government. Now, I want to go back to that first election, that 2002 election, because I didn't know about this, so I want to learn a little bit more. What was happening in 2002 that made you decide that was the year you were going to get involved and put your name on the ballot? Was it outside influence of family members or community members, or was it you being a 24 year old guy going, I can do it. So let's do it because that's why I ran the first time. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my, I don't think my family was a hundred percent behind me on the first go. <laughs> um, Same here, man. Same here. <laughs> when, when I was going to university, the, we were driving up to the dorms and um, I had my, I took a few years off. And so my dad was driving me up to, to drop off all my stuff. And there was a big sign for an election there. And the first thing he said to me is don't even think about it. <laughs> so I did it anyway. Um, 
No, when I came home in 1996, the mine closed and the, that was devastating for our community. Um, we had roughly 300 families up and leave after, after the closure, which just gutted our community. So by the time you get into the two thousands, there'd been a lot of upheaval. Um, we had people leaving the community. EI had worn, you know, it's, it's gone. Um, people are now struggling. Um, and then you throw in the political climate of the early two thousands in British Columbia and, you know, our hospitals being gutted and school systems, you know, barely holding on. And, and it's just like, every time you look at anything, there's more stuff happening and local governments having to pick it up. And, and it's really, really having a negative impact on the future of our community. So um, being a, you know, being from the student, you know, realm, you know, you don't, you don't always think before you leave. And uh, <laughs> I guess that's the best way to say it. So um, but you put uh, your name on the ballot in 2002. And yeah. while you run to expect to get elected, you actually do get elected. Yeah. What was that experience like? Like, first off, let's talk about that campaign, because were there issues on the ground that a student leader was shocked to hear about when you were door knocking? Um, not, not so much because this is my community, right? This is, this yeah. is home. So when I, but had there must've been something that you went, wow, I'm shocked that this is like, I know it's I almost think the, 20 I think, years ago that we're talking about, but yeah. let's see if, let's see if the old Spencer memory can work. <laughs> no, I, I think the biggest one was, was healthcare and the lack of economic development. I think that was the two, the two big kickers, right? Um, we had just gone through some major changes in healthcare. Um, they just pulled beds out of our hospital and we went from being a fully operational hospital with, you know, surgeries and, and uh, births. I mean, I was born in that hospital um, to really being a first aid center at that point. I mean, it was, it wasn't looking good. Um, so, you know, I, I got involved right away on, on dealing with that. And I was, there was a big protest over in, in uh, Penticton where there was hundreds, if not thousands of people. And we marched through the bed, through this, through the city with, you know, holding empty bed frames and stuff to represent how many beds every community had lost and, and whatnot. And that was kind of one of the big parts of it. The other part was the economic development. There was nothing, there was no growth happening. And when you're watching, you're watching all of your, all of your future just evaporate in front of you. Um, I think that was what everybody was concerned, right? Like, how are we going to hold on as a community? How are we going to continue? How are we going to have jobs for our kids? Um, how, are, how are my grandkids going to stay here and, and whatnot? So that really was my biggest focus was like, let's get this sorted out. And like I said before, like coming from the, the student world, like we had massive budgets. We had all these things. I was a vice president of student services, which was a massive portfolio to begin with. Right. And I mean, we had healthcare, we, we had transit, we had, well, we ran a bar and a newspaper and all these things. So, you know, there was a lot of transferable um, real time practical knowledge that I would, was able to just bring into the world that I was now stepping into. So there wasn't a lot of surprises there. It was more, how little money we had to be able to do anything with was, was probably the biggest surprise. You walk into that ballot box for the first time. And I always like this question because it gives me a sense of how humble people can be when they actually get to vote for themselves in that matter for you walking into that ballot box in 2002, what type of feeling was going on in your body at that time? Because we always remember the first time you get to vote for yourself. But when you go municipally, it's a completely unique beast because you're putting an X beside your name, which is going to affect the people's lives that you, if you are elected, are elected to represent. For you, what was that like? And do you still hold that same feeling every time you've gotten elected in 2018, 2022? So this is going to be a surprise to you, Chris. I actually live just outside of the town boundaries. <laughs> so I've Oh, never... that's right. No, BC no. is such a weird situation yeah. like that because you don't have to live in the community you represent. No, but I do live in my community. It's just I live okay. on the other side of this imaginary line. And I've never actually been able to vote for myself. 
and most of my family and people like to say, oh, it's because your family, because we're, you know, rather large family. But most of my family lives on the same farm. We've lived there since 1928 is when my great grandfather bought the place. And we've we're still there. And I've never I've never been able to vote for myself. Um, my dad, surprisingly, uh, picked up the mantle of local politics uh, later on in life. And uh, he's now our area representative at the regional district. And uh, I got to vote for him uh, twice now. So that's that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, that just changes that line of questioning then. But I want to talk about being elected now, because campaigning and being elected are two different beasts in itself. You can go knock on doors and you can hear the troubles that people are struggling with, whether it be healthcare, whether it be economic development, whether it be potholes. But when you are elected, when that blue check mark gets beside your name or that star in BC for some strange reason via civic info, I don't still don't know what that means, but it's, I guess it's elected. Um, you now have the weight and responsibility to make the decisions that will affect people's pocketbooks. Yeah. And you are right when you say you are the front line of politics. The day-to-day -day decisions you make are affecting the day-to-day -day lives of people. How much of a responsibility do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chamber from even back in 2002 to when you were uh, elected first time as mayor to 2018? How much of a responsibility do you put on yourself to make sure you get you get it right? That is, that's a big question. Um, my entire being right now is, is this role. Um, you know, every morning, just about every morning, I try to make it down and have coffee with, you know, the guys down the at the Senate? coffee shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and I listen to them and, and I listen to people, you know, they stop me in the grocery store. I think that's a big disconnect between us and other levels of government as well. We are completely accessible so, I mean, I have people coming to me and they're telling you your, your, you know, their, their fears and, and their real concerns. And I take every one of them very seriously. Um, so just before the atmospheric river, um, I used to manage a business in town and the owner decided it was time to, to retire. So he closed the business and I've been a full-time mayor since then. And this is everything I do. And it's, um, it's a big responsibility. But it's also something and I, this is something that a lot of people I don't think fully understand either. I don't do anything for like, right now, like I there's a big picture. And I want my grandkids who aren't born yet to have an opportunity to live here. And I'm hoping that their grandkids have an opportunity to stay here. So when I go into that council chambers, I'm thinking not just about ourselves and, and right now, I'm thinking, what are my kids going to have? What are my grandkids? What are their grandkids going to have? And how can we set a legacy that in the future, they still have the same opportunities, if not more than what we have now. And so every, every decision I make is not just about right now. It's about the future and it's also about everybody around us because we live in this wonderful system here where we have the regional district and our regional district area is quite removed we're we're just over um just over an hour hour and a half roughly to the next major center and the regional district area h is what it's called around us it's massive it's the size of the entire rest of the regional district combined so you know, we're the service hub for them. So when we make decisions, I also consider what what impact am I going to have on these people that call Princeton home, but they don't live in our boundaries. And I think that's an important part. Um, I'm also the vice chair of the regional district. So I always have, I kind of flip back and forth. Many those hats two hats. On. Yeah. <laughs> I want to, I want to pose this question. I wasn't going to, but it's, it's an interesting statement you just made there. How do you balance that need of the growth and the future of your town with the here and now, because if I go talk to your community, they'll be saying we need to deal with these issues right now. But as mayor, you have to look, like you said, at the future. You can't just look at the here and now, because if you do, nothing is ever going to move yeah. forward. So how in your five years as mayor so far, which we're going to get back to, and I know we're talking about issues right now, but I find That's this okay. a fascinating conversation. How do you balance the needs of the future with the needs of the present day residents who are 
dealing with the issues that are coming up? They're kind of one and the same, right? If if you okay. so say one of one of the big things we're dealing with right now, and it's not even our wheelhouse, but we seem to be dealing with is healthcare <laughs> and mental health and all the rest of it. So provincial downloading is an issue. <laughs> what? <laughs> Sometimes, eh? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, or even we'll say our, our infrastructure. Infrastructure is a major problem. I mean, we're, we just borrowed uh, for the first time since 1974, I think it is, we, we borrowed money. Um, we're doing a $7 million infrastructure upgrade um, because the pipes that we're replacing are 60 years old or over 60 years old now. So, um, you know, right now, the immediate issue is we keep having you know, water breaks and and everything else on top of all the stuff we're still dealing with on the flood. But if we want to be able to have capacity in the future and we want to have future growth, those old lines need to be replaced. So you look at the big picture and you say, okay, out there, I want, I want to be able to have a sustainable community. In the meantime, in order for people to continue to have water, I need to have those lines replaced. So it's one and the same, right? If you, if you don't look at just, and I think this is where a lot of, there's some people have some problems with, and it's like, they look at right now, they only look at like, what's at the end of their nose, right? They're like, right now I need this. But if what you need is part of a bigger problem, how do you solve that bigger problem? And that's, that's the real, I think, key to making local government successful is don't just come into it and like, I tackle every issue right now. It's like we tackle it, but what's the end game and how do we get to that end game? And I think that's the real, the real key to how we should be looking at local government. It's, it's never about those immediate things. Cause if we just try to chase all the little issues, you never get anything done. But if you stick to your plan and our council, and I'm super lucky, you know, in the last election, um, we, we didn't have a, we were all challenged, but um, it's the same council came back. We set a vision in our first year. And at the end of the four years, we, we tried to make it to that, that end game. And, um, you know, I said, right from the get go, let's not, let's not look at, well, we'll have a 10 year plan, but like right now, what can we accomplish in the next four years? How do we get to that end game? So everything that we're doing right now, in the second term is a continuation of that. And it's just to continue moving forward in these in these four year increments so that we can make we can have real, you know, real outcomes. It's not just let's go build this, let's go do that. Like what is the purpose of building that? And how are you going to pay for that? And and I think that's that's something that doesn't always get seen. And especially at local government, and we're seeing it right now, you know, so many new people coming into local government. And they're one issue candidates or whatever, and they haven't thought about what the big issue is and or the big picture is, and how do we solve the big picture? Because none of these little problems that we have are isolated, right? If we have homelessness, it's because of the opioid issue, and if it's because of the opioid, it's probably because of mental health. And where did the result? Why is there a mental health problem? It's because we closed all the facilities in the early two thousands and we've caught up, everything's caught up to us now. And now we're dealing with this massive epidemic and, you know, so everything's connected. We just have to, you have to understand that and move forward from that and, and have a plan to deal with it in that way. I'm going to throw in the political question here. And I, I threw it into a few of the other mayors that I've spoken to in BC, but You've you've talked about some issues that are not municipally minded issues. They are provincial or heck, even federal issues that you're talking about. Are municipalities like yours, like the town of Princeton, dealing with more federal and provincial issues on a regular basis now in 2023 than you were, say, even in 2018 prior to the global pandemic and the COVID-19? Yeah. Um, I think, or even from when you were first elected in 2002. Yeah, we deal with way more. Um, when they brought in the uh, community charter back in the early 2000s, there it really changed the municipal game in BC. Um, you know, we went from just managing really some roads, water, sewer, basic infrastructure needs, some recreation, and that to now where the more it seems like the we're bigger partners and everything. Like we sit on, I think I sit on five different health committees. Um, it's not even 
a municipal responsibility, but we're dealing with primary care networks. We're dealing with mental health. We're dealing with the hospital. We're dealing with so many different things. Um, you know, there's, <laughs> is that for the betterment of the community? Do you think? And again, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus no, here no, to answer the question. It's, it's a just, good question. It seems like you're an open guy. No, I am. I'm an open book. So um, <laughs> it is a, it's, it's a double-edged sword, I guess, because in a way it's, it's not our wheelhouse. I have no authorities in any of it. Um, but at the same time, I can represent my community's needs the best to the best that anybody can. Um, somebody at the health authority sitting in Kelowna or somebody sitting in Victoria might not necessarily understand that the health needs in Princeton are not the same as the health needs in, in downtown Vancouver or downtown Kelowna or even in the village of Karameas, which is only, you know, 45 minutes or so away. But I can sit there and I can say, no, our community needs this. I'm an industrial community, you know, like we we have needs that aren't the same as a tourism, you know, purely tourism community. And we need we need proper representation for that. Um, I will say that when it comes to dealing with the provincial government, um, the last four or five years have been a lot easier than they had been in the past. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the relationship I have with our MLA. Um, we're, you know, we talk quite often. Grand Forks and Princeton are a lot of the same and, and our MLA is from, from Grand Forks. He was the, he was on the regional district there. And so we got a lot of similarities and we can discuss these things. Um, but, Oh, I'll just say it. Do you, th the, do you think the federal like, government's what? nowhere to be found, right? Like, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> it's it's a it's Answer. painful. Come on. I, I'm no, I'm just being honest with you. Like, it's it's painful. Like, in order to get and that it really bugs me to be honest. I was going to say another word, but it really does bug me because, you know, you watch these you know throne speeches and all the rest of it, and they keep talking about. And here we are, the federal government that doesn't even recognize municipalities as a as an entity under the constitution. And here they are talking about getting involved in our world, but they only really want to talk to cities, right? They don't want to talk to little towns. They don't even know where half of us are. And here and they, they don't they, even want to talk about cities. They just want to talk about capitals. Yes, exactly. And it's, it's so painful. And, you know, I was listening to um, one of the after after one of the scrums or something afterwards yesterday and they were talking about the throne speech and and all that and and i think it was krista freeland and she's saying something about um you know the, the federal government came to the table but with health care and we're really pushing the province and and if we're going to do climate change it's the same thing it's like give me a break you know here we are my community is the front line of climate change, right? Mine and, and Mary. <laughs> we're going to talk about that later. <laughs> and, you know, and all my neighbors, we're, we're, we're the front line of this. And, and in your healthcare, we're, it's a federal government responsibility to send that money. And then that trickles down to now me having to be involved in healthcare. And, and in a way that, I mean, I've become quite proficient in, in, in healthcare issues, but that's not my job. And then for the you know federal government to be standing there saying you know oh you know we're we're cracking down on these provincial guys it's like you're not funding us um, you know that's that to me really gets under my skin when when you hear federal leaders talking in that way and it's the the in Ottawa I think there needs to be a big change in attitude and how they deal with not just the provinces but the local governments as well. You have just set up a perfect segue because later on this year, we're actually going to be doing a series just on that is the federal relationship with municipalities. So thank you for teeing that up so nicely. <laughs> really appreciate it, Spencer. Oh, I got lots to say on it. <laughs> oh, I, I, I will, I'll invite you back on for that series. I want to know, though, because you are someone, like you said, you're an open book. You kind of have... Uh, a pulse in your community you don't get real you don't get elected and then re-elected without having a pulse in your community is it challenging to be a small town mayor in 2023 with all the issues that are going on yeah yeah it's i, and, I have a lot and of it's friends not, it's no. not getting easier is it no it's not um the civil 
I guess the civil discord is what you'd call it, has really changed in the last, well, on our last term. Um, Even in your community? Yeah, there's there's certain elements of every community that have really changed. Like, there's no, there's some people out there that just hate you for being you, you, right? And it and it has, but it's not in the real. I hope it doesn't actually have anything to do with me. It's more the position or the fact that you're in a in a position of authority, and you know the pandemic. Um, the pandemic was rough. Um, local mayors and and councils I think like we became the target for for a lot we didn't have any say in anything that was done right it came from the federal or provincial government um, we had to abide by the same rules everybody else did um, and in some cases we have to be even more responsible to those to to following those rules because that's where half of our funding comes from so you can't really you know wiggle around it and and we became the targets for a lot of that anger. And I know I have, you know, colleagues that are no longer in their positions because of they became targets. And that is, that's horrible. Why is Princeton a unicorn in that situation? Because you're right. You guys were the only, one of the few councils that had a 0% turnover in the last election. And comparing that to 2018, when Every councillor and mayor got turned over. There was no incumbent reelected in 2018 compared to 2022. Why is Princeton such a unique unicorn in that way? Um, well, I th- I think it's a lot to do with the work we've done. Um, you know, like I'll, I'll be honest, like there was a lot of the COVID stuff. Like we're we're pretty remote, right? Um, we we brought in a lot of the rules and and whatnot. We didn't lay anybody off. I, I watched as a lot of our you know, municipal colleagues, they, they laid people off. We didn't do that. We, we found other jobs for our staff to do. Um, we tried to keep as many functions going during COVID that we could to, you know, if there was like a big celebration, if we could spread it out on an outside area, then, then we tried to, cause we tried to keep community together. Um, our tourism numbers went up despite, you know, destination BCs wanting us to, um, but we're so close to Vancouver. Um, you know, we're, three hours from the lower mainland so you know all these day trippers and campers and that so we we saw a way to be able to capitalize on some of that and we're we're a beautiful outdoor mecca so if you want to go and be outside and not have to run into somebody the the greater princeton area is the place to be i mean you've got what is it i think around 50 lakes to go to you got rivers you got streams you got you know mountains from it's the, literally you know. like you've listened to one of my shows before you bees you've hit <laughs> tourism you've hit issues like you are just the oh, master yeah. of segues <laughs> well that's the, <laughs> no but that's the, so we saw that and we're like let's 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 encourage that right like let's let's keep our businesses going let's try to encourage this because when we come out of it we don't want to be the ones that are just you know hurting and so we kind of stuck to our plan And, you know, we didn't cut taxes, we didn't cut utility bills. And I know that was unpopular at the time. But, you know, we didn't have to have major tax increases to make up for 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 losses, because we we had already set out a plan. And we'd already adopted our budget. And it's like, why, why change from the course, like, if we do, everything we want to do is going to be farther behind. So we just kept moving forward. And it kept people working, and it kept the economy going. And I don't think we got hit as bad as some other places during the pandemic. And I'm not criticizing anybody else. I think we just were in a position that a lot of people weren't in at the time. And then you fast forward to, you know, the atmospheric river and we worked hard to bring our community back as fast as we could. I mean, we're still a long ways away. I mean, we just got permits on our water system last week. So, you know, but, but we've always been about the community and bringing the community together and, and growing our community and trying to find ways to make sure everybody has a place here. And I think that's the difference between some of the sentiment out there and what we've done. Um, I hope it continues. I mean, 
I always laugh. I said, I think I'm one of the only mayors that gets hugs in the streets. I've been down with a couple of ministers and people give me hugs downtown and I just, I chuckle about it. But, you know, during the flood, you know, I was front and center. I was in people's homes. I was, you know, help sandbagging and, and doing whatever I needed to do. And members of my council were doing the same thing. And because of that, but we're all from here too, right? Like, um, I'm, I'm lucky in that sense. Uh, one of my counselors, I went to school with his brother. He's a year older than me. Um, I used to work for one of the counselors. Um, one of our other counselors, Randy, he was the mayor for years and now he's on my council and he's, you know, he, he's lived here for most of his life and we have a really good relationship and he's there to support me when I need support from, from that side of things. And then one of my other counselors, I've known her, I've literally known her like all my life. And she was my babysitter at one time and my CAO, I used to work for when I worked for the regional district. So, you know, we're a tight knit group and we're, we're very community orientated. This is our home. None of us are going anywhere. So this is our priority is, is home, right. And making home better for not just ourselves and our families, but for everybody who lives here. I am cautious of time here and I know we're literally at the 35 minute mark and I haven't even asked you the second question of the second segment yet, but I'm going to now. I'm okay. going to start. I'll I'm try to start. be fast. Hey, no worries. Hey, you have an hour. Let, let's kill an hour, man. Um, as much as you want. <laughs> exactly. Um, I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the mayor's opinion. So mayor coin, as of recording this interview, what is the biggest pressing issue for the town of Princeton today? Do you just want one? <laughs> what are the pressing issues then? <laughs> I'm going to have to change that because everyone says, do you just want one? I'm like, okay, guess I have to change that now. Oh, um, really? We're, we're dealing with a couple of really big ones right now. The biggest one um, is getting drinkable water again. Um, we're still on a boil water advisory. Um, from really? from the yeah we just got permits to be able to um our construction permits um that's been a long slug to get that happening so we're, we're finally there uh that's probably my number one asked question when i go downtown anywhere is what's happening with our water um but it's it's moving forward and and we're literally moving as fast as we can the next one would be what are you guys going to do with the dikes and the river everybody wants us to dredge the river um Climate change has drastically changed the the future of not just our community, but I think this entire region of British Columbia. And um, we want to, whatever we do needs to be based on science. It's not going to be based on emotion or, you know, um, opinion. It needs to be based on solid science. Yeah, I know. Go go figure, right? Go figure um, that things shouldn't be based on opinion. If that's the case, I have some four-year-old kids who really want gummy bear. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but no, seriously though, like when it comes to comes to what our mitigation plan is going to be, I I need to make sure that we do the best job we can do because um I've seen some modeling what happened in California. If that was to happen here, um, I don't even know if our community would still be standing, right? Never mind what's on the other side of the mountains from us. So there's, there's some big concerns there and I want to make sure it's done right. Um, and then I guess the, the other big one, and it's people don't really relate it to the same issue, but it's, it's around mental health. Um, I've been really, really pushing for mental health supports in the community um we have for the first time since probably the 1930s we actually have like a homeless population in town i know we're not supposed to say homeless anymore but it's we have a homeless population and we have um last year we had a little tent city being built and and whatnot and and i'm really i'm really aware of it and i'm concerned and I'm also concerned with some of the attitude around it. A lot of the people that were living there had been longtime residents. I knew one of the there was a there was a young fella there that I knew since he was a little boy, and and now he's you know he's a man now, and he's he's he was living down there, and and then I had new people in the community who just wanted him gone, just run him out of town, 
And I'm like, these, they have nowhere to go. Like this is their home. This is the only home they've ever known. And now they've fallen into hard times and some of them have, you know, um, mental health issues. Some of them have been, you know, abused as children. Some of them, you know, there's a, there's a myriad of problems and then we don't have any support. So, you know, anybody who, who knows people who are usually addicted to a substance or alcoholics, there's always an underlying issue or there's usually an underlying issue. And when we don't have those supports in place and the mental health supports in place, and we don't have anywhere to put people in a temporary shelter or in a, in a, in a subsidized housing, which is another big issue for us is we don't have enough subsidized housing for, for, um, for residents. So when you add all these up, it all goes back to pretty much the core item. Why, why are people in this situation? It almost always goes back to the fact that we don't have enough supports in place to keep them out of those out of that situation or when they go looking for help there's nobody there to help them and i've been struggling to get that support in town and i've i've come up with a plan and i've presented it to the ministers and i'm hoping that i can get some traction on it this year um but it's 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 a slog man like it really is like there's a lot of money being spent all you over feel the like place. you're running in in a pace in the same place with some of these issues because um sometimes I, I i'm gonna be i'm gonna not burst your bubble here because i'm pretty sure you understand this but provinces don't look at communities your size and say well we don't we don't have the money oh. because the biggest issue is vancouver or victoria or Kelowna or this that or the other the larger urban centers does yeah. it feel like you're yelling into the void of the unknown and just hoping that someone is hearing you Sometimes, um, but I don't know if you've noticed or not, but I'm not a very quiet voice. <laughs> no, you are not on social media. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, and I, I understand why they don't want to put supports here, but I'm really pushing for those people in senior levels of government to understand that even though we're remote rural, we're also a service center for a bunch of other little remote rural villages right like we have i guess one two three four five or six little unincorporated areas around us that this is their service hub so although penticton who's an hour and a half away from us is our service center we're a service center for all these other people and we need to start understanding that rural rural canada not just rural bc but rural canada is pretty unique that way. Although we get our services from major centers, we also have people coming to us for assistance. And when you're that far away from the next major center, then there needs to be a, a, a shift in the way we think about service delivery. And it might not make sense to put something in, you know, the little town that's between the two of us or, you know, something like that. But when you're an hour and a half from the nearest you know, major hospital, then you need to be able to put services in that community because we go all the way to, well, just about Manning Park, which is halfway to, you know, halfway to um, Hope. So, you know, for from there to Penticton is over two hours. So you're really starting to talk about a very large service area that is underserviced. And the sooner we can understand that, the better. Um, but the other thing that I think we need to kind of get through some people's skulls. thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say skulls is, for you there, Mayor. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice here. <laughs> really am. Um, no, it's like, so like the province right now is coming out with all these rules and, and stuff, and they're trying to, I don't want to stay strong arm, but really encourage strongly communities to stop, you know, saying no to things. And one thing, my community and my valley, and I will say it's our valley because um, you know, we're part of some, we're, we've got a pretty unique situation here in the Smilkameen Valley, which is awesome, by the way, if you're ever looking for a place to go, go to the Smilkameen Valley, but there's Princeton, there's three electoral areas, there's the village of Karameas, and then there's the upper lower Smilkameen Indian Band, and um, most of us sit on the same board, we have a Smilkameen Valley Planning Society, we cooperate together, and we we deal with things as a, as a sub-region within our region, 
and all of us are on the same page that we need these supports here. So there used to be a treatment center um, between Karameas and Headley, which are just down the river from us. And it's empty right now. And we're like, fill it. Like, let's put another treatment center in there. Let's get people the supports they need. And when everybody else is saying, not in my backyard, our valley saying, bring it to us. We are more than willing to take it. We want it for our own residents and we'll take some of your residents as well. And we want to support people in our communities because once we send them somewhere else, we know they're not coming back. So I'm going to challenge you on that for a little bit here. I'm going to push back a little bit here because you're saying, you're saying, yes, we want it in our backyard, but are your residents wanting it in their backyard? Because you're the mayor, you're there to represent the the town and the area, but there's a I vocal... guarantee you there's a nimbyism oh, in yeah, every there is. community. Oh, yeah, there is. Community. So is oh, that and I'm in not... yours as well? Oh, of course there is. But it's not as, I don't think it's as prevalent. I mean, they're loud. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I've i I've gotten to some pretty heated arguments with people <laughs> who, who seem to think that none of this stuff should exist. But at the same time, those services have already been here and now they're gone. So we have a proven track record that it's not an issue, right? It's not something that, you know, let's get rid of it. Like we, we like compost facilities. That's a big one, right? Like nobody wants a compost facility. We have two in our area and, you know, we're like, it's just part of doing business, right? Um, But there's always going to be people that are against everything. And if you always just say, okay, well, you know, that minority of people don't want it, then let's, let's walk away from it. Then it's not doing the best for the bet for the greater good. Right. Like, and if that's the sort I fall on, then that's the sort I fall on. But when it comes to our community, I always say, and I always say this is we are only as strong as our weakest link. And if our weakest link are the, those people who are down and out, then that's the strength of our community. And that's how strong we are. So if we don't take care of the people who, have the least and and can't look after themselves what does that say about us as a community it doesn't say much so um and i i've sat in coffee shops and i've argued this and debated it and you know usually at the end of the day we all walk away with some sort of understanding that we can't just abandon everybody because it's not you know the 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 cool thing to do right now and i know there is a big push right now to to demonize and and put people who have mental illness and and substance abuse issues and homelessness and and they you know they they like to point fingers at them when we had our homeless camp and i know i'll get some heat for saying this the crime that was happening in that homeless camp was people committing mostly major crime against them right the thefts were happening against them they weren't going into their neighbor's yards it might have been the people that were coming down to rob them that might have been in your neighbor's yard, but it wasn't those people. And at the end of the day, I mean, there was even a letter in the letter to the editor in the paper saying my opinion changed after I met these people and understood what was happening and whatnot. And I mean, there's still a, there's still a very vocal group in town that say, get rid of them. They're it's horrible, but you know, there always is going to be. And, but again, like if, if we're going to, we're going to ignore those who are in the greatest need, what does that say about us as a community and as a and as a society? You've talked about some major issues that your community is facing right now, whether it be the boil water advisory, whether it be health care, whether it be mental health, whether it be climate change, the dike, the rivers. Um, but if I go talk to 100 people in your community, they're going to tell me some local issues. They're going to tell me, yeah. tell me some micro issues, that pothole. And this is going to flip the, this is going to flip. I, I, I'm assuming there's potholes, the in, there, I'm assuming there's potholes in your communities. I'm oh, not hundred yeah, percent yeah. sure, but every it's community spring, has, there's potholes everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going to flip the sort of the question around here for you. We talked about how provinces and municipalities or provinces in the federal government focus on the larger urban centers. How do you as mayor focus on everyone so they don't feel like they're the municipality in this situation where their issue and their priority isn't being heard? That's a hard one, but um, <laughs> no. Um, Did I get him for a loss of words, people? No, I'm just trying to, <laughs> trying to, yeah, maybe. <laughs> no, I'm trying to think how to word this right. Um, you know, we we kind of look at it as a whole community approach. 
right? So if we're looking at say roads, we we have a priority list on our roads and we 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 do it every year. We find out where the worst parts of our roads are and we we focus on them. We're not doing big grandiose, you know, let's pave Main Street every couple of years because it looks nice. We try to find the worst part of the of the community and and fix that. When we when we decided what infrastructure to replace, um, when we went and borrowed borrowed money, it was based on reports from our engineers. They went and did it, so it was done properly. Um, this year, we're looking at doing a um, a rec parks and rec uh, uh, study because we we understand that there's deficiencies in our parks and better better than just us going around and saying, okay, we're going to fix this park and we're going to fix that park. What are we going to do? How are we going to fix those parks? What is the best for the community? Not just, you know, where am I going to get the most votes or whatever, you know, like it's, it's what is the most appropriate thing for the community. And that's kind of how we look at everything in our office is where do we get the most bang for our buck and how do we make sure that the whole community can, can, um, capitalize off of the work that we're doing are people willing to hear that though are people willing to understand the fact that sometimes my issue may not be addressed in 2023 it may have to wait till 2024 to get a new pothole fixed in my area or a sidewalk or a park upgrade in my area yeah they're not happy about it but they do understand (laughs) it Uh, but i mean how i'm talking to you is exactly how i talk to people downtown right like i i'll go to the seniors hall and we we had to rip up a bunch of um uh pavement down there after the flood and you know it's it makes the seniors hall all dusty and stuff and i go down there for lunch and and they they harass me all the time like what are you going to do about that and i said like let's face it i'm not going to pave that until i know that we're done with any dike work down there because if we pave it and then we have to rip it all up again we're just wasting your money right like sometimes we have to do what's best for the tax dollar that we have not based on what we want and i don't get everything i want so, <laughs> you know, like we, we, you know, we, we failed twice with uh, grants on, on a new swimming pool. Um, that's a big bone of contention in our community. There's, there's a, you know, it's, it's, we're not sure exactly where it sits right now, but there's a large portion of our community wants an indoor swimming pool, but with the price, the price overruns on everything right now, it's just not something that we have the ability to build. Right. I mean, talking about a, um, well, it'd probably be close to $40 million, you know, recreation center when we have to do $10 million in, in infrastructure upgrades just doesn't make sense. So when we is, are, trying is it to- challenging to make a priority for infrastructure with the cost of ballooning issue, like the cost of living and the cost of services going up so dramatically over the last oh, year and a half? It's insane. It's absolutely insane trying to do this. Um, we've, we've been successful on some grants. And when we went to get the, you know, when we sent it out for RFP and we get the, you know, the numbers back, the grants that we got were not even, well, there was a good one. We got $150,000 for airport lighting. Um, We put it out, that went out just before COVID. Um, We got the results after COVID came in and the project went to $500,000 because there's no electronics anywhere, right? There's no way to to get these things. Um, That same project now is pushing I think it's $900,000. Like, how do you plan for that? So we're very aware of it. And that's the thing that I, I'm very honest with people. Like when we're talking about, okay, you want this? Yeah, it sounds like you should be able to do it for, you know, thousands of dollars, but we're talking millions of dollars. Everything that you think you understand the price of, like you're going to have to triple, quadruple, and sometimes multiply by 500%. Like it's just, there's no rhyme or reason right now. So Every project we're doing where we, we factor in, you know, a very large, you know, inflation rate on it. And then when it comes in and we put it out for bid, we we cross our fingers and hope for the best because that's all we can do right now. And it's, you know, labor cost has gone up. I mean, we're we're going to see another spike in, in fuel costs coming up on April 1st. And when that happens, you know, that's going to jack up inflation again. And it's going to be even harder to plan for things. So um yeah it's it's hard but as long as you're honest with people i think that goes a long ways and when you just sit down with them and say like listen i understand that you want your street paved but you know we have a plan to replace the infrastructure there in the next five years if i pave it right now 
And that's going to cost us 150 to $200,000 to pave it. And I'm going to go rip it up in two years. And then I'm going to put in, you know, a million dollars of the infrastructure and repave it. Which one do you want? Do you want us to do it right? Or do you want me just to patch it so you feel better about driving over that piece of road? And at the end of the day, most people say, don't waste my money. So <laughs> they're, they're happy, you know, they're not happy, happy, but they're happy with the, with the answer that it's on the list. It's going to get done at some time. But I mean, we're putting priorities aside because we don't have the funding and we don't want to raise taxes to a point where it's unobtainable. And I mean, we, we're we're stuck, right? Like we're seventh lowest in the province right now for taxes. To be able to get to the middle of the pack, we're going to have to raise taxes, you know, significantly over, you know, a certain amount of years, but we're not going to do that. We're slowly going to increase and we've been sticking to, to our increase and and this year, you know, we're looking at about 9%, whereas usually it's 5%, but we have to factor inflation in. So, you know, there's there's things we just have to sacrifice and we all do it. And, but you got to be honest about it. And when you go sit down with those people who really want that, you know, pothole fixed in front of their house, say, yeah, we'll come and patch it, but you're not going to get a new street this year. Like, it's just not, a, it's not possible. And usually at the end of the day, they're happy about it. I want to ask one last question before we turn to our last segment, and it's about apathy. There has been a big, big apathetic draw when it comes to municipal politics. We are seeing voters turn out going down, down, down every election. Um, in the town of Princeton, would you say people are engaged and are willing to give their feedback if you ask for it? Or are people willing to be the keyboard warriors on social media and then look for the vocal minority to give their opinion and not worry about saying anything because it might ruffle feathers? That's a good question. So it's a new question I'm adding into the new rounds no, of these episodes air. <laughs> It's it's mixed, right? Um, with some things, people just don't they don't engage in at all. Like like this is this is an ongoing issue. Like, like do you think local... the people of Princeton know what a municipal your town does? Like, I can guarantee you, if I go ask a hundred people, they'll know what the province delivers, what the federal government delivers. But would they know who their no. councilors are or what oh, what they the know... day to day responsibilities are for town council? I think they would know who their counselors are. I don't know if they would totally understand where our sphere of influence is. Um, we we struggle this, this at the regional district. Like I said, I'm the vice chair there. And, and we I just had this conversation with uh, our communications guy yesterday because we're working on an infographic on what every level of government does. Because, you know, at the regional district, we don't deal with roads, but they've got all these roads in the regional district. So it's like, go talk to the province. So there's always these overlapping issues like people, the water is a perfect example. I get hammered. Why aren't you building the water? It's like, well, we need approval from the health authority to be able to build the water system. Well, why is that? Aren't you the town? Yeah, but <laughs> we have to abide by certain rules too, right? And and that's that's a building code is another one, right? Like, why is your building inspector so hard on us? Well, there's a BC building code. And if we don't follow that, then he loses his job. Like, this is simple, right? But I don't think everybody understands that. But there are things that people are very tuned into. There's other things that they just don't seem to care about. And the hardest part is trying to engage them in a way that they will, I guess, interact with. Like it's like we put things in the newspaper. This is funny. The water, right? The the water is has been my biggest thing for the last few years. So I've been on national TV. I've been on provincial TV. I've been on regional TV. I've been on web content. I've been on radio. I've been in the local print media. I mean, if there's a medium, I've been on it. I've even done some videos and people still will walk up to me. What's going on with the water? And it's like, well, it, I was on TV last night. I don't watch that channel. I don't read that newspaper. It's like, I don't know how else to get it. It's on our social media. Well, I don't read social media. <laughs> don't you know you have to go door knock every single door in your community yeah, I, and talk to them one on one for at least I, an hour every know, single right? day? <laughs> that's why I go to the coffee shop as often as I can. Um, but no, that's that's the biggest challenge is is that part. But you know, when I got elected as mayor, it was like one of the largest turnouts we ever had, and I think there was just an appetite for change at the time, and then. This time around, I mean, it was still high. It wasn't as high as I would like to see in it. Um, I wish everybody would get involved in, in local government in some way. I mean, like I said at the beginning of the show here, 
it is the biggest, it is the biggest impact on your life is right here. Like town council, um, you should vote for your town council because every decision they make is going to impact you by the end of the week. And it's not like months down the road. Like if we make, if we pass a resolution on, you know, Monday or Tuesday night or whatever night of the week you have your council meetings, by the end of the week, you can almost guarantee in some way that's going to be enacted. And that means it's going to happen right now. It's not like provincial government where, okay, we're going to bring in this legislation and then next year it's going to be fully enacted and we're going to give you a year lead time or federal government, who knows how long that takes. But, you know, like right now, the decisions we make are going to impact you. You know, we pass a budget, you're going to get your taxes and we start work the minute we approve that budget and it's, it's impacting you right now. So I, I would love to see more people involved. I do a lot of work with the schools and I try to bring kids through the town hall and, and whatnot. And, and uh, just about every kid in the school system knows my name. And it's great because when I was a kid, we had a great mayor at the time and, and everybody knew who she was and, you know, the big shoes to fill, but, you know, it was a time where things were happening and, and we all knew who they were. And if kids growing up can understand that there's real change to be made and we take them to all of our facilities, we take them, you know, I take the little kids to the fire hall and to the museum and the town hall and the visitor center. And I show them like we're doing stuff. And by the end of the day, they're all like, this is great. And they go home and they tell their parents and I see one of their parents downtown and they, oh, you're, you were with my kids yesterday. And it's like, yeah, that's great. So, you know, it's, it's working and I'm hoping to instill that in those young people that, you know, in the future, this could be a job for you and, and it's not a bad job. And if you're not going to want to be a politician, maybe, maybe become a engineer or something and work for the municipality or, you know, there's all these jobs and I take them into every department and show them who they are. And, you know, maybe it'll, maybe someday they'll be the next people working in town hall. And, and that's great because then they take ownership in their community too. Right. And that's key is I think for communities to survive, people need to love their community and be part of it. And there's not a lot of that anymore. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people, I mean, it goes along with apathy, but they just want government to just do their job and leave them alone, but they are the government. And I don't think enough people understand that the people of this country are the government, the government, those of us who are elected, we work for you. It's not the other way around. Yeah. I want to turn to my last segment now because I am very cautious of time here. <laughs> And I want to talk about tourism. I love yeah. tourism. I love visiting communities. I've said, if you come on my show, I will be in your community. So I have a very big right swing in uh, uh, the uh, Prince uh, Penticton, Princeton, Kelowna, Kamloops area of uh, uh, Soyuz area of BC over the summer, but I'm looking forward to it. So I'm going to be in your community, but I have listeners Excellent. from across Canada and around the world. And I would want to know, what are some hidden hidden gems that the town oh. has to offer for some uh, tourists that are potentially coming? <laughs> well, if you're coming to Princeton and you want us to stay in town, we have one of the, I think, one of the best museums in small town museums in Canada. You've hooked um, me already. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you come, Chris, I'll, I'll let me know and I'll, I'll take you for a tour. Um, we've done a whole bunch of work on our tourism. Um, it had been lacking over the last few years. Uh, we're now the bronze statue ca uh, capital of Canada. We've uh, put bronze statues all over the community. They're all based on animals. Uh, there's one Remington, and but the rest are all animals. Um, and then we have uh, Swan Lake Nature Reserve uh, in town. It's a nice walking area with uh, uh, a kettle lake. And oh, what else can you do while you're here? There's lots. Um, if you want to leave town and, and go outside, we also have a gold panning section in town that you can you can go gold pan. We have a license on it so that people can go down and and uh, try their luck at gold panning down along the river. Um, we, Find me up. <laughs> yeah, I know we're 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 the best. Um, but but Princeton's in a really unique place in the whole province um, because we're so close to everything. Like Princeton exists because of our history. Like. James Douglas sent my great, great, great grandfather here to find a new route. So the reason Princeton is where it is, is we're center from the lower mainland to the interior, right? So we're two hours from Kelowna, two hours from Kamloops and three hours from the coast. 
and we're right in the middle of everything. So we used to be the hub, right? Before they put the Coquihalla in, Highway 5 started in Princeton, and now it starts in Hope. Mm-hmm. So that's why we exist. So then we have all these lakes around of us. Um, the the village of Tulamine, which is an unincorporated community, it's got a, a lake and, and everything. We have all these lake areas. We have rivers. We have streams. Um, if you hunt, there's there's hunting opportunities, fishing opportunities, um, outdoor it's an outdoor Mecca. We have Manning Park Ski Resort. Um, just what about an hour from us? Apex Ski Resort is about the same distance. And then there's Nickel Plate uh, Cross Country Ski. Uh, Manning also has a cross country ski area. And then we have in our community China Ridge Ski uh, Cross Country Ski Area as well. So there's there's opportunities here galore if you love the outdoors. And that's that's what we are. We're an outdoor community. So. Um, Traditionally, we've always been, you know, ranching, logging and mining and, and, uh, and the outdoors. So that's what we've always, that's what we do well. So what do you do on a, after a stressful day at council or a hard day, just dealing with residents? I'm not saying that the residents of <laughs> Princeton aren't hard, aren't hard, easy on you, but after a stressful day, where do you go in town to just decompress and let all the worries go away? And before you answer, you cannot say you're own house because every mayor and counselor <laughs> wants to say that so for you where do you go joking you uh, can say it if you wish <laughs> no you know what if, if right after work is my backyard but no where i really go is i i go out in the bush i really do um uh we jump in the truck and and we go out and uh we do a lot of uh traditional food harvesting so we're out digging roots and and uh picking berries and stuff like that so when we're when it's not nothing's in season we were out scouting and and whatnot i just love being outside um i don't get out fishing as much as i'd love to but uh you know it's i we're outside as much as as possible so uh you know spring right now so i've been out cleaning up the yard and getting everything ready so that we can just spend the rest of the summer outside so uh but that's really where we are we just get out of cell range and get up and see some of the mountains and just look at some of those amazing views we have. So now it comes down to the all important million dollar question for you, Mayor. And this is the one that you can take as long as you want to answer or, or as short as you want to answer. And the question is, in your opinion, what makes the town of Princeton such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Oh. I can't say it's just home, right? <laughs> if you know, that's as short as you want, you can <laughs> say that. <laughs> you know, I chose this to be my home. So I, it's that's a really interesting question. I I grew up here. My dad grew up here. My grandfather, my, my great-grandmother, so on and so forth. Um, but growing up here... I'll be honest, I got in some trouble when I was a kid and everything, but you know, the community, I know, right? <laughs> Don't say, but the community... you seem like a very upstanding guy there. Like <laughs> oh, yeah, as a kid, you were probably just the, an angel for the people. I was, <laughs> but the community was always there for me. And I think that's what makes us so amazing is our community. Um, when, when I first got elected, I was, I mean, I'd only been, I was only 24. So, I mean, there was, and I, I asked one of the, one of our elders, I said, why, why, why did you guys vote for me? <laughs> Cause I was a little surprised. And they said, well, you, you've gone out and you've learned and you've experienced things and, and then you came back. And so we figured it was your time to, to give back to the community that gave so much to you. And that's just it. I mean, it's a community and the community isn't a place. It's the people. It really is. And the people here are some of the best people you've ever met in your life. Um, I hear it all the time. People like they just move here and they say it's so people are so kind. They're so nice. Um, you know, you need help and people are always right there to help you. And that's that's why Princeton's the best place in the world. And it really is like when I decided I was going to have a settle down and have a family, there was no other place in the world I wanted to be. And I wanted my kids to have every opportunity I ever had. And, and then some, and I couldn't think of a better community to, to raise my kids in. So I'm, 
raising my kids in this community. I, my oldest is 13 and my youngest is two and my middle one's 10. So um, they, this is their home too. And I hopefully they'll, they'll choose the same thing, but I'm going to encourage them at some point to spread their wings and go and discover the rest of the world so that they can appreciate home as much as the rest of us can. Mayor Coyne, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending the last hour with me. Um, I often say this and I, I, I never try to blow smoke up people's butts, but communities like yours are better served with people like you at the table who are passionate about local government, who are passionate about municipalities. And I, I wish I, if there's one thing I hope people take away from this conversation is get involved. You are right. Uh, we are the government. We, the people who we are elect are there to represent us and we are the people who have elected them. Um, so thank you so much for being part of your community, but being part of the show as well. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate it. And like I said, if you come to town, give me a call and, and I'll I'll show you around. I certainly will. So with that, I want to remind everyone, go put down social media for at least 15 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and God for sakes, it helps us be better. So with that, this has been the Crossport Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking. <laughs>